I have thought that a good video might be how to deal with invasive thoughts. And invasive thoughts are actually really common with people that have anxiety or depression, um, but they happen to pretty much anyone. And um, you might call it like invasive and sticky thoughts. And a lot of people will take SSRIs or other antidepressants to, uh, what it'll do is it'll make your thoughts, it, it'll make a sticky thought or it'll make an invasive thought less sticky. And so if you, if you have like a, a negative memory, a memory is something that makes you feel uncomfortable or unpleasant, the, uh, the antidepressants will oft, oftentimes make you forget about it pretty quick, makes it so it's not very sticky. And um, I had a thought because I had one of those invasive memories. Um, everybody has trauma in their life and some people, it happens with your job. And uh, my particular job, I, I have to look at um, some very unpleasant images at times. And um, some of those images look like family or remind me of family. And so then when it's the weekend or when you're not at work, um, those images, like you'll, you'll spend time and, and you'll, you'll randomly have one of those thoughts uh, kind of poke in unbidden, which we don't really have control over our thoughts, it just kind of pops up. But um, people that end up with like PTSD, like post-traumatic stress disorder, they have those, uh, well, one of the symptoms, they're gonna have those invasive thoughts and uh, they're going to be very unpleasant. And uh, it, what it is, is it's your, it's your short-term memory. It's a memory stuck in your short-term memory. That's one way to understand it. So the, the example that I came across in one of the books I read was like, imagine you lived on an island with, with tigers that were on the island. You would want to have in your short-term memory the fact that there are tigers around. And so it's actually a good thing to have memories of tigers popping into your, uh, you know, invading your thoughts on the regular basis because tigers eat people. And, um, but, uh, the way they then connect that to like PTSD is, is, uh, if you were in, in the, in wartime, if you were over in Afghanistan or Iraq, something like that. And, uh, you want to constantly be on the lookout for the things that might, you know, be dangerous to you, which a lot of times, like people say it was like IEDs. So like when you're driving down the street, you'll, you're, you'll see like a garbage can on the side of the road. And the thought that will invade would be that's a bomb or you'll you'll just have the feeling tone for bomb you'll be uncomfortable because the thought doesn't even have to arise it could just be the feeling tone it could be so uh, subconscious to you meaning you're, you're not aware of it that you don't even know the thought until someone points it out and says and then you're like oh actually yeah i do that when i when i go driving i, I that those you know things on the side of the road do stress me out for some reason um but anyway i had a thought i well i was spending time and with family and I was reminded, I was reminded of a particularly disturbing thing that I saw uh, this week. And um, it occurred to me that uh, there is a method for, um, for handling invasive or sticky thoughts of any type. And um, there's probably multiple methods, but to me, the, the easiest thing to, to do, or the most straightforward, the most logical thing to do is to understand that, the, the, and this is from Jordan Peterson, the purpose of memories um, is not to remember the past. So these invasive thoughts, these invasive memories, they're, they're, it's not to remember the past. The purpose of them is to extract from the past uh, lessons to structure the future. So you're supposed to find something practical in it, make it useful. Um, and if it's not useful, then you don't need it anymore. Um, one way to it, put away a thought is to visualize it and recategorize it. And um, so what I would do is, is when the, when the traumatic image or memory pops up into my mind, I would, instead of turning away from it mentally or trying to avoid it or just being uncomfortable or not even noticing it, um, I would try to notice it, which is mindfulness. Like you can do mindfulness meditation to do a better job of noticing your thoughts. But the first thing you'd, you would do is notice it and then you would try to recategorize it. So what I would do in this particular instance, I'll give you a, a bit more of a detail so it's more of like an example is that it was a, um, a deceased infant. And um, I, uh, what I would do is I would visualize that infant um, rather in its deceased, you know, traumatic state. I would visualize it um, in a peaceful state with, it, with its parents in a, in a more, you know, kind of heavenly existence. Because there's a lot of hard things about life and, and when we pass on, regardless of whether there's an afterlife, we are at peace because there's no more pain, no more wanting, no more suffering. Um, so there is that. 
But I like to think that there might be an afterlife as well, because why not? It, for all we know, all the intimations of heaven, all the ex, all the the heavenly feelings that we have at times might be a bit of heaven kind of poking into our dimension. We might just not be able to uh, perceive it because we're four dimensional and it could be another dimension that, that we, we cannot perceive very well. We just perceive bits and pieces of it. But anyway, so what you would do is you would take the thought, you, you would not hide from it, you would not turn from it, you would turn towards it, you would confront it, and then you would try to, in essence, extract from it something of use. So confront the dragon, get the gold. And um, in doing so, uh, like I said, the way I would do it is I, I tried to visualize the child in a more peaceful place, a more heavenly place, and uh, with its parents. And kind of like uh, Harry Potter with his parents uh, when he looked into the mirror of Erised uh, in the story, uh, in the movies, is, is a great visual for it. Um, uh, and so that's that's the method. Basically, what you want to do is you want to recategorize... Um, <laughs> You want to recategorize the the memory in a useful way, um, in a more peaceful way. And uh, you know, if you look at it correctly, it means your subconscious trying to get you to do that. Basically, it's it's yeah. Sometimes I think your subconscious can be kind of destructive, and it might just be reminding you of things that are unpleasant, just because you know, screw you kind of thing. People subconscious do that to them sometimes. That's why you want to take care of yourself, because if you don't, you, you yourself won't take care of you too. And so your subconscious will come get after you if you're not nice to yourself. So be nice to yourself, but. Uh, but yeah, you wanna you wanna recategorize your thoughts and make them practical and useful. Interestingly, um, that is actually uh, Hermes' role in Greek mythology. And Hermes represents Hermes is the logos in Greek mythology. The logos is at the core of the Judeo-Christian faith. And uh, again, it's very interesting that the Judeo-Christian faith says, you know, basically the logos, which is Hermes in essence. What are you getting mad about? Uh, the logos is. Uh, it's the it's the thing that you know leads to salvation, you know, and and, and all good things in heaven and whatnot, and uh, by using the you know embodying the spirit of the logos and uh, putting your memories away in an appropriate way in the underworld because that's what Hermes does puts things in its proper place in the underworld. The underworld being your subconscious in this particular interpretation, you can uh, put away the put away the demons and. Actually, come to think of it, and I'll try not to go too much into this, that's also the archetype in uh, Journey to the West. Um, there's a monk that sings to the demons. You know, rather than wrestling demons to uh, overcome them, he sings to them, and he puts them in a small, happy package. And uh, and then they're like a little doll that can be carried around. So you take like a, a, a an invasive, dis, you know, unhappy thought, and uh, in, in that particular way, the Buddhist uh, confronts it, the, and then the Buddhist... Uh, sings to it uh, and then puts it in a, uh, a happy little package and uh, that's how you deal with invasive thoughts um, I think that was pretty much it that's how to deal with invasive and sticky thoughts is to categorize them to put them away to confront the dragon and then get the gold out of it um, and you see like that's what they invent the examples about the various religions were is uh, you see reflections of this in religious uh, texts which I think those religious texts are basically like uh, archaic archaic may not be the best word it's very sophisticated so because it's the type it, it's, it's like psychology except it's the type of psychology unlike the dsm or like cbt cognitive behavioral therapy you're not going to teach someone of low intelligence to pass on the wisdom of cbt and the dsm so if you wanted let's say a psychology that is you're able to pass on generation to generation you're going to need something that is has vivid imagery and multiple layers and something for everybody. And that's where the religious stories come in. Very, very sophisticated.